So in the last episode, we explored the once blood-soaked grounds of the Franklin Battlefield. And I have to say, that was one of the more unique battlefield experiences that I've ever been a part of. Their interpretation and the things that they have there were just incredible. But in this episode, we moved a quick 20-minute drive north, and currently, we are on the outskirts of Nashville, Tennessee. And I am currently walking along what was once the Confederate line here on December 15th of 1864. Now, there isn't a whole lot of the Nashville battlefield that's left. However, they do have a few sites around the city that we're going to visit today and hopefully learn a little bit more about this battle. So here is Monument Park, and you can see the well-kept monument there, but something that's even cooler is this giant Bassett Oak, okay? So this was part of a 1,500-acre farm that occupied this area at the time of the battle, and the Confederate line would have been just in front of the tree in this area here. Now this Bassett Oak is a witness tree that saw the fighting unfold here on December 15th. And it has been verified by the historic landmark and tree registry here in Nashville. Uh, but man, if this thing could talk, the stories that it, it could tell us here. Wow. Now, just to give you a little backstory as to how both armies winded up here in Nashville, following the devastating Confederate defeat on November 30th at the Battle of Franklin, the Union forces would pull back to consolidate their forces in and around the outskirts of Nashville. Well, Hood and his Confederate forces would pursue the Union, and the Confederates would construct defensive works, the Union would construct defensive works, and you'd have kind of a no man's land in between both armies here. And Hood's plan was to construct these works in an attempt to draw the Union out of theirs for an offensive attack, which is exactly what happened. So my inner child's coming out a little bit. You can't not come here, talk about a witness tree, and then not at least touch it. Not telling me anything, unfortunately. All right, so we're making our way down to the monument here. And this is the general area where the Confederates would have constructed their breastworks here. So they would have run in this direction. They would have went, ran this way, anchored on the left flank by readout number one. And then they would have kind of cut southward and ran run this way. Uh, maybe a mile, a mile and a half away from this location. And panning back to my right here, the Confederate works would have ran in this general area and all the way, I don't know, two to three miles, and it was anchored on the right flank by a position called Granberry's Lunette. Now, Lunette is just a fancy term for a crescent-shaped uh, fortification. But here is not necessarily the exact center of the Confederate line, but I would say pretty close to it. And uh, let's have a closer look at this monument here. So here is the monument here at Monument Park, and I believe the original monument that was constructed was destroyed in the 70s by a tornado at a different location. And following that incident, they uh, established Monument Park here, and the monument was rededicated to those who lost their lives here on both sides. And panning back towards the monument, The spirit of youth holds in check the contending forces that struggled here in the fierce battle of Nashville, December 16th of 1864, sealing forever by the bound of union by the blood of our heroic dead of the World War, 1917 to 1918. So I guess this monument's also dedicated to soldiers who lost their lives and fought in World War One. It is a pretty well kept area. And I'm gonna to pan to my right here, and you can kind of see we are right in the middle of a neighborhood here on this beautiful Nashville morning. And like I touched on in the beginning of the video, a lot of sites that were once home to the battlefields of Nashville are no longer uh, existing. Uh, we've lost them to time and development. But there are some pockets of historic sites to visit 
here in Nashville, so don't be discouraged. And then uh, here is the witness tree. One more time. Gosh, this thing is absolutely massive. I don't think the camera does it justice. Okay, so that was Monument Park. Uh, not much here, but I thought it was worth coming here to tell some of the stories here, and uh, visiting that witness tree was amazing. Um, we're gonna head on over about a mile northwest of here to uh, a position called Redoubt Number One. So here we are. Now as you can see, we're kind of in the middle of a neighborhood, but luckily for us, looks like a storm came through with all this foliage here. Luckily for us, part of the Confederate readout number one has been preserved. So Confederate readout number one saw a lot of action on the first day here on December 15th of 1864. And it was the northernmost fort anchoring the Confederate left flank. Now the Confederate line ran along this way, and it didn't continue in this direction. It would cut south, essentially refusing their line, and it would run in this direction. Now, readout number one was one of five readouts the Confederates constructed here. They would have two and three south of this position, and then they would have four and five out in front of their lines, and the goals of those readouts was to break up any Union attack. Well, unfortunately, for the Confederates, they were highly outnumbered here, so all readouts four and five did was offer the Union easy access to capturing men and artillery because they could, really didn't put up much of a fight. But just to kind of reorient you, we are facing north. I don't know if you can see it, but you can kind of make out a few buildings in the Nashville skyline there. And the Confederate line would run this way, east. And where we started Monument Park is probably a mile, mile and a half, I don't know exactly, but it would be in this direction. Now, beyond Monument Park was the position of Granberry's Lunette that we talked about a little earlier in this video, and that was anchoring the Confederate right flank. But before we talk about that, we're going to talk a little bit about readout number one and uh, some of the heartaches the Confederates would have had to face here arriving in Nashville in early December. So the Confederate forces would leave Franklin pursuing the Union forces, and they would arrive in this area around December 2nd. Now, on December 8th, a very nasty winter storm would roll through this area and wreak havoc on both armies for an extended amount of time. And the ground was rock hard with ice. Whatever ground was soft was now completely mud. The soldiers were exposed to the elements. So making these fortifications was a lot harder than it normally is. Remember, at this point in the war, 1864, both armies are experienced. Both armies know how to build fortifications and both armies know how to effectively build what they need to uh, in a short amount of time, but that wasn't possible here. So this area of the Confederate line was under the command of Major General William Loring, and in readout number one here would be about 200 men. A hundred of those would be manning four smoothbore Napoleons, like you see before us here, and the remaining hundred would be infantry supporting these guns. Now readout number one, like we touched on, is the northernmost fort and which made it an easy target for the Union position at Fort Negley, which had several batteries there, and they were able to wreak uh, some havoc in this area. Now, I believe Fort Negley is about three miles from here. So the men here were not only exposed to the elements, not only was it hard to make these fortifications, they were exposed to artillery fire now, and they were vastly outnumbered because you would have Union troops pretty much along this line here, just waiting for the word to assault. So before the Union would launch their main attack on the Confederate left or the Union right, George Thomas wanted to launch a diversionary attack on the Confederate right or the Union left. Hopefully I'm not confusing you there. That's the area of Granberry's Lunette. And that diversionary attack was supposed to take place at daybreak. However, due to dense fog and obviously other weather conditions that we talked about, uh, that diversionary attack was delayed. Fighting in that area didn't really begin until around 8 a.m. that morning. Now, like we've mentioned a few times in the video, Granberry's Lunette anchored the Confederate right. It was crescent-shaped. 
so it was manned with artillery and infantry. Now, it was named after General Hiram Granberry, who was killed a few weeks prior at the Battle of Franklin on November 30th of 1864. So you would have four artillery pieces and almost 350 men manning Granberry's lunette. And tasked with assaulting Granberry's lunette would have been Major General James Stedman's corps. And uh, they were launching a feint, which means you want to hit the enemy in one direction and then deliver a haymaker in another direction. So kind of catch them looking in the wrong location. Hopefully they pull forces from this area to reinforce Granberry's lunette. And now this area is weakened. So that, that was the goal. Now something that's interesting about the assault on Granberry's lunette and the Battle of Nashville as a whole is the United States Colored Troops had a heavy presence in this battle. They saw a lot of combat here, a lot of hard fighting. And two of the three brigades on the Union left or the Confederate right at Granberry's lunette were made up of United States Colored Troops who were actually seeing their first combat. So the Union would launch their feint, almost 7,000 infantry against Granberry's lunette. And Unfortunately for one United States Colored Troops Brigade, the Confederates sprang a trap. As they were advancing towards Granberry's Lunette, they were attempting to essentially outflank Granberry's Lunette. The Confederates knew this. Well, they held their fire to the last minute. When they would open up, they would essentially tear into their flank. Uh, most of the regiments would then seek cover in a nearby railroad cut. Again, the Confederates would know this. Unfortunately, the railroad cut was a lot deeper than they anticipated. Once they began jumping into the cut to find cover, men were breaking bones, men were suffering injuries, and Confederate forces were essentially lining the top of the railroad cut, firing down on these United States Colored Troops. And it's estimated that hundreds and hundreds of brave United States Colored Troops would be killed in the action at Granberry's Lunette. Now to bring you back, to readout number one, here's one of the pieces here. Man, there is just nothing better than Civil War artillery. And obviously a lot of this foliage wasn't here. You would want these open fields of fire here. But just to kind of give you another layout of the land here in this neighborhood that I'm in, that's quite peaceful, I might add. And here's one of the other artillery pieces here. Honestly, I would love to be one of these houses. I'd probably be here every day. And again, the Confederates had four smoothbore Napoleons manning readout number one here. Now, with the current state of this battlefield, we gotta use our imaginations just a little bit. So, we are facing, I believe, west. Maybe southwest, but that's where the main Union force would be attacking from. So, right now, the Union forces are launching their feint, and a few hours later, again, remember, there were some delays, the main Union force would attack the left flank of the Confederate line. So moving south, you would have the line moving this way with readouts two and three. And then out, remember out front of those lines, you had readouts four and five. Well, those readouts were quickly overwhelmed, I believe by the 114th Illinois. So this position here, they had to worry about being outflanked and they were also going to be attacked from the north here. So they're gonna be hit from two sides, along with violent fighting all around the Confederate line here. Remember at Monument Park, uh, where we visited, there was fighting in and around that witness tree as well. So readouts two and three south of this position fell pretty quickly once readouts four and five fell as well. And around 4 p.m., the final assault to take readout number one would begin. And a man by the name of Lieutenant William Hall of the 36 Illinois, stated that he was able to take about 20 to 30 men around readout number one in this direction and then come up from behind and capture the readout. Now, I couldn't really find any accounts backing this up, but I also didn't find any accounts dismissing it. So I thought it was worth at least sharing here. There is nothing better than coming to a battlefield nice and early you have it to yourself. Granted, this probably isn't a huge tourist draw here at readout number one, but there's nothing better than coming to a section of the battlefield, having it all to yourself. And it helps me envision it and kind of how things unfolded here. Um, you got to use your imagination a lot with this one because there's modern structures all around it. But if you're ever uh, wanting to go to battlefields and stuff, go early because then you can, you can truly just take the time to take it in. Now, following the final Union assault here, this position would obviously fall, and 
it would just domino down the Confederate line. So readouts two and three fell, readout number one fell, and now the rest of the Confederate line was beginning to fold. Hood, instead of retreating from this battle fully, he would consolidate his forces a couple miles south of this position and reestablish new lines. And that's where we're gonna be headed next. There's one spot left of that portion of the battle, and uh, I can't wait to share this with you. So we are at Shy's Hill. At the time of the battle, this would be called Compton's Hill. And we'll get into why uh, this hill would be renamed to Shy's Hill a little bit later in the video. But I just want to kind of reorient you as to where we are since we have moved. So readout number one and Monument Park are in this general direction, several miles. Uh, this is facing north, and that is facing towards the town of Nashville. Now we are at Compton's Hill or Shy's Hill, which is anchoring the Confederate left flank. And in this direction, you would have the Confederate line running this way. And on the right flank is Peach Orchard Hill, which is anchoring the Confederate right flank. And real quick before we start our hike, if you ever visit Nashville and come to Shy's Hill, uh, it's a little confusing. So you'll find this parking area right at the base of the hill here and you can park all along this road here. And the name of this road is Benton Smith Road, which is off of Harding Place. So there's a nice parking area. There's my wife down there, and you have this walking trail. And we are going to hike up the Shies Hill and see this battle from the Confederate perspective. And then we're going to come back down and we're going to make the assault in the footsteps of the Union troops here. So as you can see, this isn't a overly tall hill, but we're about halfway. And remember, we're not under any enemy fire. I'm gonna scan back and show you where we came from because it is a pretty aggressive slope here. So there's a road where we started. And like I said, we're about halfway. Good at panning back towards the summit. And there's where we gotta to continue to go. All right, moving on up. You don't realize, now like I stated, this isn't a huge hill, but you also don't realize just how out of breath you're gonna get. So imagine your adrenaline's pumping and you're under fire here. The man next to you just got hit. You gotta keep pushing forward though. Now, my adrenaline isn't really pumping. Almost lost my footing there. However, I did have three pounds of French toast this morning for breakfast and about 800 milligrams of caffeine. So that's probably contributing to my uh, shortness of breath here. All right, so we have made it to the summit of Shy's Hill here. And it's a little taller than I anticipated, but if we look in this general direction, that is north, somewhere in this area. That's where the city of Nashville currently is, and that's the position of the Confederate fortifications that we visited earlier in this video, Readout 1 and Monument Hill. So following the Union attacks on December 15th of 1864, the Confederates would pull back several miles south to this location. And like we touched on, this is Compton's Hill, now called Shy's Hill. And along this way, and the camera here, the Confederate right flank was anchored by Peach Orchard Hill. And now we are on the Confederate left anchor of Shy's Hill here. See a better break through the trees here. You can probably see some of the buildings of Nashville. But when the Confederates would pull back here, it would be the dead of night. And remember, weather conditions weren't advantageous to entrenching. These men have been fighting all day. They're exhausted. Some of their friends aren't there anymore. So when they would place their fortifications on this hill, they would place them on the crest. Now that doesn't sound bad, it sounds like a good idea, right? Well, unfortunately, the angle of this hill, when you position your men on top of the hill, the high ground kind of works against you because of the angles and slopes here. So if you're on top of the hill, 
you can't really shoot down, there's blind spots. So what you wanna do is entrench yourself on what is called the military crest. And that's usually several feet down. You know, it could be five feet, it could be 10 feet, it could be 50 feet down from the summit. But the military crest is, so we would put our fortifications down here. And what that would do is not only mask our lines, because it would kind of blend in with the background, but it would give you better angles of fire and you can really shoot down on the opposing forces and utilize the high ground to its advantage. Now, see, I want to show you something. So we are pretty close to the crest here. Now, this is where we just came up from. You can't really see it, but if we establish our lines on what is called the military crest, where you're still on the high ground, but look how much more terrain we can see. Now this may not even be the best spot that I'm standing, but I felt like it offers a pretty good visual. Now I don't want to make assumptions because I really don't know for sure, but I don't know if you can see it on the camera. It's, you have some raised ground here. I'm not sure if those are the original Confederate earthworks that were constructed here for the battle, or if they've been restored, or if it's just protruding out because it's right next to the walking path, but that kind of gives you an idea of where the works would have been at the crest of the hill here. And I want to show you one more time of the crest here. Now from here, this looks like a pretty good position. But remember, you got breastworks and you're crouching down. You can only lower your muzzle so far until the Union troops are on top of you. Again, can't really fault the Confederates because we, don't, we weren't there. We don't know what kind of conditions they were experiencing and the manpower issues, tool issues, what the ground was like. But here we are on Shy's Hill facing north and uh, we're gonna continue on here. Now, upon morning, Benjamin Cheatham was not very pleased when he would wake and find that his lines here were out of alignment with the rest of the lines of this direction. So before the attack, they kind of had to reorganize their lines here to make sure that there wasn't a gap in them. They were able to clear out some foliage here to build some makeshift breastworks and some earthworks. But again, this was, they did this through the night. They were exhausted. Remember the weather conditions. And another issue the Confederates were facing is their artillery. They were already outnumbered three to one when you talk about their artillery. Now, I believe 30 of the 34 guns in Cheatham's Corps I believe were unavailable. It may, it may be a little more were available, but I, I, I remember reading a large portion of Cheatham's guns were unavailable. They just couldn't get into position in time. And then ones that were able to get in position were pretty much ineffective. However, they were able to place a reduced battery on one of the slopes of Shy's Hill here. And that battery would be commanded by Captain Rene T. Beauregard, who is the son of PGT Beauregard. So I, I thought that was pretty interesting. But these Confederate batteries stood no chance against the Union batteries who were entrenched. They far outnumbered the Confederate pieces like we just touched on, and this place got hammered by Union artillery here. So something that I find interesting is in this area, you had Finley's Florida Brigade. Now, I don't know the exact location, but it was somewhere in here. And within that Florida Brigade was the 3rd Florida Infantry Regiment. And due to their losses, they kind of combined with the 1st Florida Infantry Regiment. And at this battle, they were kind of referred to as the 1st slash 3rd or the 1st 3rd Florida Infantry. Well, within that Florida Infantry Unit was a company, Company B of the 3rd Florida Infantry. And they were mustered in St. Augustine, Florida. That is where I'm from. So I find it fascinating that I traveled here from St. Augustine and I'm standing in the exact spot that men from my community 150 to 160 years ago would muster and find themselves fighting on the slopes of Shy's Hill here. And to come to this very spot is a pretty cool feeling because it, I didn't really know about this until I was doing research for the battle. So I wanted to share that with you. But this is the general area of Finley's Florida Brigade. Now this area would be breached by the Union Infantry assaulting up Shy's Hill here. And Finley's Florida boys were some of the first to uh, give way here. So this is a little bit of Shy's Hill in the Confederate perspective here. Now we're gonna move back down the slope and we're going to make the assault in the footsteps of the 10th Minnesota Infantry Regiment and the rest of the Union soldiers. All right, so 
We made our way back down the hill and we're going to uh, learn about this battle from the Union perspective. Now my wife just brought up a good point. She asked why I didn't film going up with the Union perspective and then the Confederate perspective instead of going up there, coming back down just to go back up again. And you know what? I don't really like her logic. So we're going to keep it unorganized and chaotic here. But this is the general area. Uh, this is a monument dedicated to the Minnesota troops who fought here. We saw the Minnesota flag on top of Shai's Hill. Well, this is offering a little bit of insight as to why there's a Minnesota flag here. And I'll read it for you because it's probably hard to see. On Shai's Hill, December 16th, 1864, Minnesota troops made what historians call the decisive charge in the decisive battle of the Civil War that led to the destruction of the Confederate Army of Tennessee. The 5th, 7th, 9th, and 10th Minnesota were in the 1st Division of the 16th Corps, fighting as a detachment of the Army of the Tennessee. Minnesota suffered the most killed and wounded following the Battle of Nashville, and that regiment, the 10th Minnesota, suffered the most casualties of their brigade combined. Now, we just touched on multiple Minnesota regiments. We're going to walk in the footsteps of the 10th Minnesota, and we're going to begin making our way up Shai's Hill here. So we just started. Now, we're in the footsteps of the 10th Minnesota. Now this wasn't a straight on attack. It was, Minnesota was kind of heading in this direction. So their flank was kind of exposed and the Confederates were pouring deadly volleys right into their flank. But they kept pushing forward here up the summit of Shai's Hill. We're gonna continue making our way here. Just a beautiful area. And while we're talking about weather, I've mentioned it numerous times in this video. Look at the size of this tree here that has been uprooted at some point before my visit. Just another testament to the power of Mother Nature. So imagine brutal ice storms in December of 1864 and what it would have done to the terrain here. All right, continuing on. This gets kind of steep here. And let me show you something here. Now, You've heard me mention military crest. Well, you can't see the crest of the hill. It is a little behind this ridge here. The Confederates put their lines too far back. So I'm not exactly sure how identical this terrain is now in 2023 as opposed to 1864. But again, this offers a little bit of insight into the Union assault here. And we're going to stop at the 114th Illinois Monument here. They were also part of the 16th Corps and they were also part of this attack. And they saw a considerable amount of action on the first day of the battle as well. They were in charge of taking readouts four and five that were the Confederates' advanced positions on December 15th of 1864. Now in this location alone, Minnesota would suffer three enlisted men killed, one officer killed, and you had 11 enlisted men wounded, four of those mortally. I'm not sure how long this attack took, but the 114th suffered some casualties in this general area as well. All right, let's continue on. So we're beginning to make our assault. Right now we would probably be getting hit with small arms fire. Uh, the Confederates didn't have much artillery like we talked about, but this is straight up. Remember, we're trying to be, we're trying to maintain our linear formations here and uh, footing's pretty tough. So imagine December 16th of 1864, the ground is hard with ice. Uh, in some areas, it's probably really muddy. Footing's probably very difficult. And now we're under small arms fire and the 10th Minnesota, which would have been assaulting through this area, their flank is exposed. You can't see it on the camera, but behind you directly is the summit of Shai's Hill. And we're kind of moving perpendicular to Shai's Hill. So our flank is exposed. And right now we are suffering heavy casualties, but we're pushing forward. I almost lost my footing there. I don't know if you saw that. All right. So I'm gonna hop off the path a little bit. There's a worn section here that looks like it's kind of a natural path, but I wanna get off the established path here. And we're walking up Shai's Hill. Remember, we're a Union soldier making this assault. Up the hill here. Your best friend who you enlisted with is now 20 feet behind you with a mortal wound. You gotta keep pushing forward, there's no time. All right, I'm taking a gamble here, turning the camera around because I'm not watching my footing. 
but we're assaulting up the slopes here, trying to find cover behind the tree here. You can hear the mini balls ricocheting off of it. You know, maybe I'm reloading, maybe I already fired a shot. Maybe I just fixed my bayonet and it's, I'll take my chances. But now, we're continuing. We're continuing, we're almost there. You keep advancing, keep advancing. Now your adrenaline's pumping. You're almost at the summit. And finally, we break through the Confederate line and begin the Confederate collapse here at Nashville. Before we wrap up, taking a little more time to kind of walk in the area of Finley's Florida Brigade and uh, the St. Augustine Blues, Company B of the 3rd Florida Infantry. It's just a, a really cool moment, at least for me. Um, you know, there isn't a whole lot out there about the St. Augustine Blues, but to find uh, some, one of the places that they fought. I don't know how many died here. I don't know how many even made it here uh, from their initial enlistments, but it's just, I admire the bravery on both sides. I mean, you don't have to agree with a certain cause or ideology to acknowledge the bravery. And that goes for the United States Colored Troops as well. You know, those guys picked up muskets and fought for something they believed in when they were facing a lot of adversity, even from the Union. And yet they picked up a musket without hesitation, charged up Peach Orchard Hill and suffered horrendous casualties in the face of overwhelming Confederate defenses. And they carried on and I admire that. I can't tell you how much I admire that. Now that I got my breath back, in the beginning of the video, we mentioned that this hill was called Compton's Hill. It is now called Shy's Hill. Well, William Shy was a Lieutenant Colonel commanding the 20th Tennessee at the summit of Shy's Hill. He would be shot and killed point blank right to the head. And because of his bravery and his determination to hold this ground at all costs, literally it cost him his life, the hill was renamed after him. Now Shy's commander, Brigadier General Benton Smith, he would surrender upon the Union forces overwhelming the Confederate defenses here. And he would be taken back to the Union lines. While he was being marched back to the Union lines, he was struck several times in the head by the blunt end of a sword. Now, Benton would survive his injuries, but however, he suffered brain damage and he would be institutionalized in Nashville for the remainder of his life. That was a little bit about Nashville. A lot of the battlefield is gone, like we discovered, but there are still some sites that can really help tell the story of the Battle of Nashville here. And I hope that this video not only brings awareness to these sites, but hopefully you learned a thing or two, because like always, I do. And uh, like I always say, we're gonna catch you on the next one. All right, so we're wrapping up here at Shy's Hill. What did you think, Reagan? What did you think? Is it everything you hoped and dreamed? Your first battlefield visit? Yeah, 10 yeah. out of 10. <laughs>